yeah, well things are steaming up today. It's getting hot, if you know what I mean, on the Blackstone. And it's in light of the hot topic that we're talking about today here at Miles City. And not only is it hot, but it's controversial. And speaking of controversial, I've learned most recently this summer as I've been starting to get into grilling or griddling, if you will, how controversial cooking and grilling can be. I mean, I talked to, to one guy and he's like, no, you gotta do your meat like this. I talked to the other guy, he says, no, 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 you gotta do your meat like this. You gotta talk to the grill masters. And then if you ever start to talk on a man's turf or a female's turf about how grilling should be, look out, it could get a little tense. And uh, speaking of tense, that can be kind of what our topic can lead to today is just a little tense. Now this past year, I, um, my, uh, I got this Blackstone. And uh, my kids were complaining, saying, you know, Daddy, you, you're not, you never grill like all the other dads on the block. And then my neighbors were even busting my chops. Like, when are you going to get a grill, man? So I finally broke down and got this thing. And I got to be honest with you. I promise you that I, kind of vulnerable here, I have literally cooked more in my entire life this summer than I've cooked in my entire life. I mean, you name it. I mean, you could put like, you know, a whole thing of like two pounds of bacon, not smelling up the house, you know, pancakes, omelets, steaks, filets, chicken. I mean, uh, hibachi, I mean, you name it, you can do it. And so um, we've been just loving it and just having fun this year. Over the summer, one night, my kids, they wanted um, hamburgers. So I said, sure, not a problem. So I cooked up these hamburgers, so excited about them. We're all sitting out at the patio, just enjoying life and having the hamburgers. And then, uh, we're starting to eat into these hamburgers and as we're eating like the texture was like this mushy like cottage cheesy I mean, it was just like the most Debacle nasty hamburger and we're all like what the heck and here's what happened uh, Dad missed a couple order steps in the in the process of cooking and so uh, when we were getting out the hamburgers, I realized, oh shoot, they wanted hamburgers last minute. Well, they were frozen. So in order to thaw them, I grabbed the hamburgers, put them out, took them out of the package first. I took them literally out of the package first. Then I took the hamburgers and just dumped them in a hot bowl of water, which you know where I'm going here, like takes all the flavor, absorbs all the water, and it just becomes this mushy mess. And so the reason why the hamburgers were so chaotic and awful was because I went out of order. And when you do things out of order, then things can get out of order. Order is important. Order is important. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today as we deal with looking at the order of the church and the order of the home and the order of men and the order of women in the church. And, you know, this topic can be kind of tense and can be uncomfortable. And I just want you to know that, um, you know, I understand why it would be. And But another thing that we have to understand is that um, God's order is going to be different than the way that the world sees this order. And so, again, we just need to make sure that we lean in and try to be Holy Spirit-led and have grace as we take a 30,000-foot view over this topic. And as we look at all the different landings on this theological issue about role of men and women in ministry, um, just know that we all don't have to agree. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree. There are people on our staff that don't agree with, the, with where the church here, our family of churches, lands. And, and that's okay uh, because we can still serve Jesus together and be on mission with Jesus together because for many, this is more of a minor issue. Now, for some of you, this will be more of a major issue and this will allow you to kind of take more of a deeper theological study for yourself to see where you land. Now, I also want you to know that we didn't just come up with this like last week, okay? Uh, this has been, as I've written this content for our family of churches, is, you know, a content that, you know, from my teen years to my younger years in seminary in my 20s and 30s and now here in my 40s, like, you know, having a broader understanding of God's scripture to get to where we land as a network and as a denomination with more of a complementarian view. And so I just want you to know we've done our best it, uh, with this material today, and again, we can't go into all the depths, but in this material today, uh, we have tried very, very, very hard to make it not based on just what I feel um, or an individual pastor feels, but more about what does God say and wrestle with that. So, I hope you're hungry <laughs> uh, to dive into God's Word today as we sizzle things up.
Well, let's pray. Father, uh, I just ask that you would help us to receive uh, what you want us to hear today and stretch us and challenge us uh, as men and women as we keep striving to move towards you. Father, please, I ask you know I need your help. As always, control my pace and my tongue. Um, and I pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, hey, if you have a copy of the scriptures, I want you to open it up to the book of 1 Timothy. We'll be at the end of chapter 2. And uh, remember, this is the Apostle Paul, who was a real person. Uh, this wasn't a made-up story. He's writing around 63 to 66 AD, and he is writing things down. This is the inspired word of God that he is writing through the Apostle Paul to give clear instruction to the church of Ephesus and beyond. And so he's urging them to stay the course when it comes to the health of the church. And so we'll kick off here in verse 11. We'll just kind of read through the whole thing and then we'll back it up and kind of pick it apart. It says this, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. And I want to just stop right here to know that that's not saying that women are saved and have salvation through childbearing. This is saying that in spite of the sin, in spite of pain and trials, in spite of all that we have to go through, that God makes a way for salvation for both men and for women. It continues, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife, sober-minded, it continues, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, then how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall and then to the disgrace into a snare of the devil. And so we are going to unpack more of chapter three next week as we look at the qualifications of leadership for an elder. But today we're going to focus more specifically on the roles that we see here. But I wanted you to kind of see it all in the context of this uh, of this of the whole package. And so today we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15 as we unpack uh, this complementarian theological view where our church lands. And so let's go back to verse 11. It says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And I know just all you ladies that are listening and watching right now are thinking, wow, that sounds awesome. Uh, you're, especially as we read this in 2022, this seems a little male chauvinistic, doesn't it? It seems a little domineering, like, hey, women, we need you to be quiet. We need you to zip it. And I know all you ladies just love the word there, submissiveness. So let's unpack this just a little bit. Uh, now, the first thing I want us to focus in are the first four words here. Say it out loud wherever you're at. Let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. This was a big deal, just even saying those four words. This was a major shift. Because back then, in the first century, women had many limitations when it came to learning back then. And so we have to understand a really important truth that when women in the first century would hear the teachings of Jesus, read the gospel messages of Jesus, read the letters of Paul, listen to the letters of Paul, hear this idea, uh, this wasn't, they weren't reading it through the lens of, 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 of this limitation, go to the next one. They were learning through the lens of this. They were seeing it through the lens of an invitation. Jesus was shifting the culture, uh, giving women a voice that they never had. I mean, these freedoms and these opportunities that they never had. Um, when you think about all the freedoms that women have today, especially here in America, but we know that all over the parts of the world and the Middle East and beyond, like 
women don't have the rights that you have that we have here in America. And so it was almost like how it was in the first century. And so Jesus was offering new opportunities for women to flourish in their giftings before they were often very squelched and forbidden. Now, as we continue to look at this text, we must remember uh, that this is used in the congregational setting, like the church setting, the congregation. So when it says this next, it says, let a woman learn quietly. This word quietly in the original Greek language has this idea of, of, of peaceable, to learn peaceable, without contention, without objection. Instead of you seeing this as okay, every time a female walks into a church that they literally have to zip their lip and they're not allowed to say a word, uh, this was not the case, which would actually complement what Paul says later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 5, where he says, but every wife who prays or prophesies with, uh, with head uncovered dishonors her head, since this is the same as if her head were shaven, uh, showing that women were able to pray in public and were able to prophesy in the congregational setting. And just the whole concept of the head covering, it, it wasn't as much as about like if you had a hat on or a covering or not. Uh, back in that context and culture, uh, the head covering symbolized that they were under authority. They were under the authority of their husband or they were under the authority of the church leadership. Now, also just a little side note uh, that back then, uh, women and men would sit on different sides of the room. And so some people think that Paul said this to help stop women from asking a bunch of questions and interrupting and to wait for the right time to do so. That's a possibility, but we don't know for sure. Now, as we continue, it says now the word submissiveness, the word submissiveness. Uh, This word submissiveness in the Greek language comes from a a military orientation, uh, which suggests order and rank. And as we know in the military that there's different ranks and order and it helps the Army and the Navy and the Air Force operate um, in, you know, in, in, in great f- manner, especially when chaos arrives. But we also know that role and position is not about uh, you know, their worth or their value. It's about position and role. Uh, there's a great scholar whose name was Warren Wearsby. Actually, fun fact, his daughter comes here to our church, a member here. Uh, he said it like this. Anyone who has served in the armed forces knows that rank has to do with order and authority, not with value or ability, just as an army would be in confusion if there were no levels of authority. Now, another thing that we must be clear is that Paul is not just talking about general submission, that you know every female has to submit to a man no matter what, no matter who the man is. This was under uh, the, the level of a father, of a husband, and of church leadership. Uh, we see scripture talk about this in the context of the home in Ephesians 5, verses 24 and 25. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. But even more important here, we see husbands, we need to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so we see this in the home, but we also see this in the church. We see how scripture gives order in the home and within the church. Now, Paul goes on to verse 12 and he says this, uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now, we have to understand that this is not speaking about two different things. This is not saying that a woman should not teach or that a woman should not exercise authority. It's combined in the Greek language as a woman is not to teach to exercise authority. A woman is not to uh, teach uh, over a church congregation with doctrinal, scriptural interpretation. Now, this is where it can get very divisive and very controversial. Now, some would say that, well, that was just a cultural thing and that Paul was just dealing with a local Ephesus problem. So therefore, we don't need to worry about that today. That's their context. That's their culture. That doesn't affect or transfer into our culture. The problem with that argument is that Paul gives his explanation to why he says that next. He gives an explanation, and it's not based on context. It's actually based on creation order. Let's hear what he says. He says, for... For, meaning all that I just said, I'm going to back this up with the beginning of God's truth through creation. For Adam, going back to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 1 through 3, Adam was formed first, 
then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. In the beginning, God created male and female in his own image. We read how he first created man, but then very soon a major problem, a major discrepancy was taking place. He was literally looking at Adam and being like, we got a problem. <laughs> Which he's right, because <laughs> we all know as guys, we're a bunch of knuckleheads. And he, he literally looks at us and says, you should not be alone. And all the guys watching are like, amen, you're right, we shouldn't be alone. And then what did he do? He says, I'm going to make you a helper. Now, the helper is Eve. And sometimes women, you can hear the word helper and think, well, that's not good. That seems like, you. what am I, your maid? What am I, your servant? No, no, no. The word helper, just be encouraged by this, the word helper in the original Hebrew language is the same helper word in Hebrew that God uses to help his people. And so don't ever uh, think that you're just a helper, that you weren't just created as an additive, but as a key essential part for the mission and for the great commandment mission for the glory of God. I love how Matt Chandler says it like this, a pastor. He says, men and women are distinct from one another, but also dependent upon one another. Men and women are distinct from one another, but also dependent upon one another. They are equal, but not the same. And we're not just talking biologically here. God knew before the beginning of time, when I think about my marriage with Jen, that, that I needed her giftings and talents and who she is to compliment me to bring glory to God with my life. And vice versa, God knew that Jen needed my giftings and strengths to compliment, to help bring God glory through her life. We see that God created order in the very beginning with Adam and Eve with their very uh, distinct roles when it came to uh, how it was all set up in headship. This was also set up before the fall, and it was also set up after the fall when we see this, when sin entered into the world. I mean, you think about it. Uh, even though Eve fell first, everyone always wants to blame Eve, but Scripture never bl blames Eve. It's always on Adam, and it rightfully should be. Romans 5 reminds us of this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death to all men because all of sin. Uh, sin entered into the world because of one man. But when what did, who did God come to in the garden first? Eve? No. But Adam. Well, even though Eve's the one that took the apple, why? Because he, Adam, was ultimately responsible for his wife. He dropped the ball. He was in charge, but failed to lead his wife. Isn't it interesting that Satan's first attack on humanity was to mess up the order of authority in the family? He went right to Eve first instead of Adam. He skipped over the general and went right to the colonel, out of rank. His goal was to mess up God's order and design, and it's worked. Which side note, all you men listening, our responsibility, if you didn't know, is to make sure that the spiritual temperatures in our homes are cooking. Just like a great steak that's sizzling, we need to constantly be measuring the temperature of the spiritual condition of our homes, of our wife, of our children. We are held, no matter if you want to agree to it or not, you are held accountable to look after and care for, the, for your wife and for your children. And God forbid... When we talk about this whole issue, that there's any man listening that uses uh, the scripture and distort it and to take it out of context to use to demean your wife and to look over your wife and to, and to enslave your wife or to, or to try to diminish your wife. If that is you and you have used God's word and verses like this uh, to distort and, and, to, and to like, you know, dominate and domineer, and, you know, with, with, with a fist to your wife, then you need to literally repent and turn around. But also, men in this room that are being passive and you're not really caring about the spiritual temperature and you're just letting your wife do it all and you're just like, yeah, whatever. Like that, you also need to get up and step up and you need to take the spiritual care of your homes more seriously and not allow the world to disciple your family, but to make sure that you are leading your home to be discipled by the Jesus that is in you, that is coming out with light bursting from your life because of Christ inside of you. 
Men, God has given us this treasured, great responsibility with the authority to serve our families. And when we don't, oh, the damage that it can do upon generations. And when you think about our world today, look around. It has a lot to do with the weakness of husbands and fathers not stepping to the plate and caring for the temperature, the spiritual temperature of their homes. So Paul backs this whole order up of a woman's role in the church with the role and order of which the family was initially designed, which makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, why would God order our family life differently than our church family life? Let me say that again. Why would God order our family life differently from our church family life? But listen, again, I get it. There are so many different ways to interpret this. And so for the rest of our time, I want to show us four main camps of this uh, debated, hot topic, controversial, theological issue. And I, I want us to check out this great chart by Guy Mason, uh, who put this together. Uh, and I think it'll really help us kind of see, uh, as we go through each of them, a 30,000-foot view. And, um, and just so you know that in each of these camps, there's far left and far right, and in the middle, or right here, or right here. I mean, there's so much uh, for each of these, but just let's do a little fly over on this complex conversation. The first thing I want us to, to notice is the feminism uh, view when it comes to this issue. The, feminine, uh, the feminism view is the idea that there's no difference between man and woman at all. And any difference is literally a limitation and a slap in the face to women. Um, it's the idea that if a man is in control, it just leads to the oppression of women, that men cannot be trusted. Uh, far extreme feminism uh, is the idea that can even lead to gender identity being confused and overlapping biologically. In many cases, it has the idea that the Bible was written for men or by men for men to protect the power of men. Most of Christian feminism movement will hold on to one or two verses and then question the majority and the errancy of the rest of the Bible. And so that's the feminism movement. Then if we go over to the far right on this issue is the patriarch issue, is the patriarchy view. This is the idea that women are only meant to be here and exist to serve men, uh, to submit to men and just to basically bear and raise children. Uh, this is the extreme side of the patriarch. They will, they will overemphasize the power of man over women, even though, yes, God is masculine and he revealed himself in the flesh uh, as a man. And even though he has given the order that a woman should always be under the headship of either her father or her husband or a brother in some cases, extreme patriarchs have taken advantage of this and have caused disturbing scars and pains upon women. And they often overlook the idea of the partnership uh, the helper, the sacrificial laying down key point of the relationship. Not understanding that women are not supposed to be looked at as subordinates, but they are to be looked at as sisters in Christ. Not subordinates, but sisters in Christ. Then we meet, move on over to the e egalitarianism view. Egalitarianism is this idea that there is real, is there's no real difference between men and women in the family or the church when it comes to roles. Not biologically, but specifically by roles. That everything is fair game and is designed for both sexes. They are not suspicious of male leadership as long as there is an open seat for a woman as well at the table. So if there's going to be male preaching, that's fine, but there better be a woman preacher as well. Male, lead, male eldership is fine, but there better be a female eldership uh, at, at the table as well. And a lot of times what is argued in egalitarianism is that headship, um, they will argue that there was no headship before sin entered into the world, which we already discussed that there was. And now because of Jesus canceling out the curse of sin, that there is no more order and that there is no more headship. And they will use Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, which says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Now this verse is so true, and it's such a powerful verse when it comes to how God views his kingdom and looks down on all of us as male and female. But it is very difficult to say that this verse shows that he shattered the order of the family and shattered the order of the church. Now often then what happens is in egalitarianism is the culture card is argued. But we've already went over that. Paul defends that this is, this is uh, not a culture deal. He backs it up with creation order that transcends into our culture. So then what happens is, is oftentimes the list of the mighty, amazing women show up uh, all throughout Scripture. They're brought up. I mean, let me just read you some of them, like Deborah the judge or Esther who protected God's people, prophetesses like Hilda and Miriam. In 1 Corinthians 11, we already saw women prophesying and praying in the church. In Romans, we see Priscilla and her husband Aquila teaching Apollos. We see women active in the work of ministry. We see how a woman was the first evangelist to share. Remember, she, a woman was the first evangelist to share the resurrection news to the disciples, which... All of these and more are true, amazing, powerful works of women recorded in Scripture. And there are still amazing, powerful works of women all throughout ministry since then that we see even today that use their powerful gifts in the church. However, we don't see a defined example or a pattern example of women teaching over a congregation or serving as an elder or overseer in the church in the Scriptures. In all the Old Testament, all the Old Testament covenants and promises that God gave, it was given to a man. When we think about all the priests that were all throughout Scripture in the Old Testament, the Levite priests, they were all men. And if Jesus was the one in the New Testament, and when the New Testament you know, comes into play because of Jesus, if Jesus was the one to shift this and overturn this, you would think that Jesus would then install at least one female disciple. But he didn't. He made all of his 12 disciples male. Now listen, <laughs> I get and understand the debate. I have many great friends that land here as egalitarianism. I, I have partnered with them. We've done ministry together. I've spoken on their stages. They've spoken here on our stage. Uh, and, and, and we have a different perspective and we have a different view. And, 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 and it's okay. Um, but listen to this uh, sharp author, Tim Keller, and what he said. Um, and this is where, this is, this is helpful. This is kind of where I'm at uh, personally. Uh, on the one hand, women are clearly partners with men in ministry, we see. As I just kind of read, you know, women were ministry leaders. They were active in evangelism, discipleship, education, mercy ministry, leading in house churches, as well as praying and prophesying in public worship. It appears from this that there are no ministry gifts or no ministries that are forbidden to women, and yet Paul draws some limits. And yet Paul draws some limitation. And that is the underlying issue for me that I constantly have to wrestle with, to not just dismiss. And so now we have the complementarian view that I've already kind of went through and taught the whole text through that lens. But that's the lens that it's the idea that God created both male and female in his own image, equal in value and worth. But according to his purpose and his design, he created them to fulfill distinct but complementary roles within the family and within the local church. Jesus did not come to cancel out God's design or order, but to interject the beauty, and to reaffirm his design and his order. So as a complementary view, we can't just throw out all the headship scriptures in order and just say, well, that was the context in its time. We can't just say, oh, it's a new era. Because we believe God's design for men and women from the very beginning was intended to have order. And that has not changed. And that's the complementarian view. So... How does this play out here in our church, in our family of churches? It means that all women are encouraged, just as men are encouraged, to exercise their God-given gifts, to cultivate them, to develop them, to use them, uh, that their gifting should not be suppressed or that their gifting should be overlooked. It would be a massive loss. It would be a huge shame if this church did not exercise the gifts of women. And in fact, when I think about the history of our church, if it was not for the giftings and the talents of women, this church would literally be a crapshoot. 
I mean, sadly, because we need more men who need to step up and use their giftings, but even more so is the strength of women's amazing gifts that are being used here in our church. I mean, I think about our staff. I mean, half of them are women. And and I think about our female leads and our female city groups and our female um, uh, 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 coaches. And the list goes on and on and on of all the giftings that women exercise and use in our church. It's just phenomenal. Women here at our church can have the highest role um, in our our church. It's, It's offered, except the office of elder or the office of lead pastor. Any other position... Women are, it's like, it's all open. It's open invitation. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about the term pastor. Um, Pastor has been elevated in our culture to the term of elder or bishop. And when I think about pastor, pastor in the original language is this idea of a carer of the flock, a shepherd, you know, looking out for the flock, caring. And so when I look around our church, we have women pastors, in a sense, all over the place. You know, when you think about it in that definition, uh, all of our city group, women leader, coaches uh, are, are, in a sense, pastors. All, our staff, women, are, are, are pastors, pastoring this church and shepherding and caring for the flock. But, I, I, I you know, in our day and age, I, I, I didn't want to take on the title like Bishop Travis or, you know, lead elder. I just... It wasn't, I really wasn't feeling that. And so uh, we just stuck with the context of the culture and called me lead pastor and our elders, our elders. We don't want to get hung up on those, on those titles. However, please hear me, women. Uh, just because we have no women elders or in our bylaws there will never be a lead pastor of our church that is female does not mean that women do not have a voice here in this church. Trust me, just talk to my wife, Jen. <laughs> um, and also, uh, you know, they, they have a voice at the elder table. They have a voice on our lead executive team. They have a voice on our finance team, on our lead city crew uh, volunteers. I mean, if, if we chose to take the voice of women out of the major decisions of our church here, it would be the most foolish thing we could ever do. And so that's why we don't do that here at our church. So the other way that this plays out in the complementarian view in our church is when it comes to the role of teaching. Um, This is where I struggle the most on this whole issue. When it comes to uh, headship and eldership being male only, like I I, I see it pretty black and white for me. Uh, But when it comes to the teaching side, you know, if there's the hard complementarians versus the soft complementarians, a lot of the hard complementarians would think I'm kind of soft here. And, and I understand why. Um, but this is the idea that if a woman were to teach here at Miles City, as long as that female understood that she was under authority submitting to the elders and lead pastor of the church, then that would be okay for her to speak um, in the congregational setting of the adult service. Um, but I, I get why that there's that tension there. And I'm still, you know, wrestling with, you know, that's how I feel. But I still have to hold under the authority of our network and denomination. But that's just the constant wrestle and learning as I continue to study and understand God's word. Now, for all of you women in the room that have heard all this and maybe feel limitation instead of an invitation, I hope this won't encourage you. My hope is that... This will encourage you and motivate you to sink more into the service of the Lord of how God from the very beginning has invited you to use your great gifts and how Jesus has opened up that opportunity for you to thrive in those giftings. So may you lean in to be ministers, to be teachers, to be missionaries, to be evangelists, to be leaders, to be disciple makers, to be leader of leaders. Don't ever look at distinct roles, I beg you, as limitations, but as an invitation from your creator who's put it in place. So, again, some of you are like, well, that was an interesting Sunday. Who cares? Moving on, that's a minor issue for me. For others of you, this is a major issue, and you don't like the way that this felt, and I totally understand why you would feel that way. Others of you may think that I've gone off the liberal Kool-Aid you know, drinking path uh, on this issue. For others of you, you like exactly where we land here 
as a church. My goal here was not to be divisive, but instead I hope it will inspire you to do more theological investigation on your part because wherever you land, if you just land based on one talk, then that's not good. There is so much depth that you need to research and, and understand if this is a major thing for you. Please do the work. And uh, the only reason why I would do this on a Sunday morning and pick this topic is because we're going through the book of 1 Timothy and we've decided a long time ago that we're not going to be a church that skips over the hard stuff. Last thing. And this is the most important thing that you can hear. So if you didn't hear anything, please hear this before you click off. Submission under King Jesus. Submission under King Jesus. Jesus. No matter where you fall when it comes to your view of order with male or female or within the church, no matter where you stand when it comes to submitting under authority in the home or the church, all of us have to get to the point to recognize the order that God is king and we are not. It's God, then man and women. It's getting to the understanding that at one point, and it's coming soon, that every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord, whether they have a relationship with him or not. When he comes, you will submit under the authority of King Jesus. But he's trying to get your attention now because if you have not submitted to him to be your king before he comes, then it says in the scripture that you will perish in separation and darkness and pain apart from him forever. But he doesn't want that for you. And that's why he made a way. And that's why God sent Jesus to break away the limitations and to offer this amazing open invitation to say, come, let me clean you up of your sin. Let me cancel it out once and for all. And that's why he died on a cross for us. But not only died, but three days later, rose from the dead to prove that he truly was God. And he makes it very clear that all who call upon his name will be saved. Not by what you can do, not by how much money you have, not by how much fame you have, but by humbling yourself and submitting and saying, you, Jesus, are king, and I want to make you the king of my life. And if you haven't done that, then let me lead you to make him king of your life right now. So just wherever you're watching, you can just bow your head, open your hands up to him and just say, Father, I submit to you. I make you my king. I am done living in the patterns of this world and trying to make the world my king and put the world top priority in order. I am making you my first order in my life. Thank you for dying for me. Tell him that. Thank you for rising again for me. And so right now I receive you, Jesus, to be the king of my life. As we continue to pray, if you truly meant that, please know the scripture is so clear that you will no longer perish, but you will have everlasting life and your life can truly begin now. Father, thank you so much for your word. As difficult as it is sometimes to understand it and interpret it, thank you for your grace um, as we continue to move closer to you and get more and more understanding. We love you and we pray this in the power of your son's name. Amen. Well, listen, if you made a decision to put your faith in Jesus, we want to encourage you, don't walk alone. Tell someone, tell a parent, tell a friend, let someone know of this decision or you can let us know by texting the number on the screen so we can celebrate with you and answer any questions that you may have.